All right, so you got a, a, a glimpse into the treatment court, the dreams court. I like that. Uh, we are going to next hear from uh, Dr. Britta Ostermeyer. She is the um, Paul and Ruth Jonas Chair, Professor and Chairman in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at OU College of Medicine, as well as the Chief Psychiat or Psychiatrist for OU Health, Chief of Psychiatry for OU Health. And she is um, getting set up right now, and I'm going to have uh, Tyler get her slides in order. Thank you all. And then, thank you very much. The number is fifteen eleven. <laughs> thank you very much. Good afternoon, and uh, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Sandbar and uh, the organizers of this fabulous uh, conference uh, to uh, give me this uh, very nice opportunity to present this afternoon to you. I'm a forensic psychiatrist and like to share an overview uh, with you of what forensic psychiatrists, what the role of forensic mental health uh, professionals are. We'll talk about forensic mental health professionals and I'll shift over uh, speaking to uh, to you about uh, forensic psychiatry and then dive a little bit into the scope of expert forensic psychiatry work. Mental health professionals, they are different kinds and uh, this is very uh, much appreciated. Uh, a little look at the background, a forensic psychiatrist, uh, of course, is a physician with medical school, then usually four years of a residency training and one year of a, a former forensic a fellowship and usually has two boards in general psychiatry and forensic psychiatry. We can have forensic neuropsychologists and uh, likewise a lengthy journey, four years of psychology school, one year internship, two years of neuropsychology, and they may have boards in neuropsychology and maybe in forensic psychology. Forensic psychologists, four years of a psychology school, usually an internship, and they may have or they may not have forensic psychology boards. Forensic social workers, not enough uh, around uh, they usually have two years of social work school and they may or may not have had opportunity training in the mental health field. There are no boards uh, presently uh, for those very important professionals. Moving over to forensic psychiatry. Forensic psychiatry at large, the field has two very important arms. One is the correctional psychiatry arm in which psychiatrists engage in the correctional field in jails and prisons, but also in diversion programs in mainly treating individuals uh, who are under supervision and have mental health issues. The other arm is the expert witness work. Correctional psychiatry is very important. Unfortunately, it is the largest setting for treatment purposes uh, for persons in our society. There's a dual reporting role, of course. The forensic psychiatrist has a protected, HIPAA-protected relationship uh, with their patients. However, whenever there is a concern that entails a safety threat to the patient, the inmate, or a threat to other inmates or the correctional setting, then the forensic psychiatrist has to excuse him or herself, uh, do an allowable HIPAA breach and report up uh, the concerns so they can be safely addressed. Safety concerns are, have highest priority, as most of you know, unfortunately, Suicide is the highest cause of death in 
uh, jails, and it's an important course, uh, but not the highest in prison settings as well. Especially in jails, persons come often uh, from the street arrested, and they may withdraw from substances and not have the best executive judgment. They may be overwhelmed by the arrest and highly emotional, and it often comes to acting out in self-injury early on uh, when uh, persons are taken into custody. And uh, one has to be mindful that is a limited medication formulary, meaning choices of medications are limited, and that has to do with necessary cost management. A jail or prison uh, may not have the newest medications on the market, and the forensic psychiatrist has to uh, give his or her best judgment in consultation and discussion uh, with the inmate and the treatment team of what medicines uh, could replace the medicines somebody may have been on that are not on formulary. This is important to be mindful about because there's a lot of concern by inmates and families when somebody is on a medicine and that medicine cannot be continued in the correctional setting because it may not be available. Sometimes when it's absolutely necessary to have that medicine and there can be uh, uh, good times where that's the case, then the medicine can be specifically ordered, but it may take a few days to up to a week to get that special medicine in-house. Expert witness work is necessary and often is the case in administrative processes, civil proceedings, or criminal proceedings. It is important to be mindful that expert witness work is different than the practice of medicine, the practice of psychiatry. A treating psychiatrist, a treating physician has a relationship, a physician-patient relationship with the patient. And this relationship has highest priority in protecting, in guiding uh, the patient and in actually uh, being an advocate uh, for the benefit, at, if necessary, at great cost to the patient. But forensic work is serving the courts. It's serving the truth finding process. And this truth finding may actually be in contrast to what an evaluee in front of a forensic psychiatrist uh, may uh, like to see and certainly may not align with the interests of somebody who might be detained uh, in a correctional setting. This is uh, something to be very mindful about. So here I compiled a table and I would say uh, this is an important slide that many of you know. Uh, however, uh, we want to create awareness, the differences between clinical psychiatry, treating, having a physician-patient relationship, serving patients, HIPAA compliant, documenting in medical records, access to somebody's medical records when somebody is part of the confidential protected treatment team, insurance pays usually when insurance is in place, and this can be subject to malpractice. In contrast, a forensic psychiatrist engaged as an expert witness is out to participate and help the truth finding. There is no physician-patient relationship because the agenda is not to provide treatment for the person who's being evaluated. We call the person an evaluee and not a patient in that setting. The agenda is to serve justice. There is limited confidentiality because the findings, the report uh, usually uh, goes into the legal process. There is a forensic report and this report is distinct and separate from any treatment records and uh, serving as an expert witness. One does not have access to treatment records. One must properly request 
treatment record access or a, uh, a DDA's office, or sometimes a judge may have to order access for the forensic evaluator. Uh, there are expert fees, and this should not fall under malpractice. While in psychiatry, we believe it does not fall under malpractice, it is at times handled under the hospice of malpractice in certain settings and jurisdictions. When one engages with an evaluee, then it is very important. And uh, it, if it's a criminal proceeding, I'd like to do it when the attorney of the individual can also be present that these differences to a treating physician be explained uh, to the evaluee and one ensures that the evaluee understands the differences and the assignment of the forensic expert witness. This is very, very important, this disclosure. Of course, uh, this is a confidentiality warning uh, and part of uh, fair processes and it's documented. And this is a message for physicians and psychiatrists. It's important not to wear two hats. Once a patient, always a patient. Is when you welcome somebody in your treatment office and you listen to them in a confidential protected setting, you may learn details that are HIPAA protected. Then to turn around and sit in a courtroom and disclose in a different setting where this patient as an evaluee may have some, something important to lose, which might be uh, liberty, uh, which might be in some cases life is not fair and it's unethical uh, for physicians. However, uh, as you all know, there might be circumstances in which a judge subpoenas a treating doctor to disclose information, but then it's under the hospice of this subpoena, this order uh, by the judge that uh, the treating physician may have to answer questions and the treating physician is then encouraged uh, to uh, participate but limit uh, the disclosure, narrowing it down, uh, really just focused in accomplishing answers to those questions. The American Academy of Psychiatry and the Law, uh, of which I'm proud to be a member and the treasurer, uh, is an important organization. It's the largest organization of forensic uh, psychiatrists and we have guidelines. And the guidelines also say we must strive for honesty and objectivity in our evaluations and opinions are done uh, to the best of our honesty. While we are all aware there are so many biases in any of us and any of what we do on a daily basis, but we try to remind ourselves, we try to hold ourselves as best as we can to the task of truth finding. When there's something to be gained or to be lost, money, monetary, or liberty or life, then all parties involved may skew the information. And this is something we all, uh, you as lawyers, as judges, as forensic evaluators, we need to be aware about. Uh, and this is why it's important in these processes that we have to seek verifying and collaborating evidence, which means we like to see as a forensic evaluator whatever we can get our hands on that is related to the case. So past treatment records, uh, police records in a criminal case, uh, any kind of school records, employment records, eyewitness reports. Uh, we would like to have access uh, to eyewitnesses if they are of importance. So it is important to then put the pieces of the puzzle together uh, to weigh where most likely lies the truth. 
before a forensic evaluator considers even engaging into a case, it is important to be mindful about one's own interests, one's past history, and consider, can I even be helpful? Can I be as close as possible uh, to impartial in this matter before me? And one needs to be well-educated and I'd like to receive the legal standard to be employed to the questions in writing uh, by the engaging uh, party. And one needs to clarify in the end who pays uh, and what uh, mechanism. What does a forensic evaluator owe the retaining attorney? Of course, a serious, honest, and com committed uh, quality work and there needs to be candor and where matters stand because we also uh, don't want uh, to mislead a legal team who then puts on a half a million dollar um, uh, trial uh, that might be uh, uh, pretty bad for all involved and very costly. So that's very important. It is important to, of course, recognize as a forensic evaluator for myself and for others, we sell time in the end, not words spoken out of the mouth. Um, and I personally uh, like to take a retainer. I do not like to engage in contracts because contracts are tedious. Lawyers, in my opinion, don't like contracts much either. And if there's a contract, lawyers are always very much better educated and smarter than a psychiatrist or a medical doctor serving as an expert witness. So getting a retainer and then billing towards that retainer uh, is probably the easiest. And contingency fees, uh, just uh, to make sure that's included, are unethical. And the American uh, Medical Association uh, has made that known because contingency fees tie to the outcome of the case, one cannot be impartial anymore. We express opinions with 51% uh, medical certainty. There are actually no exceptions for medical uh, forensic examiners. The standard of 51% is uh, always the same, while the standard, and you know much better than I, in legal cases may actually vary depending on whether it's a criminal case, a custody, uh, a deportation, uh, or a civil dispute. The ultimate issue is something in forensic history is often spoken about. Forensic evaluators are not permitted to speak to the ultimate issue. The ultimate issue, which you know better than I, is to be decided by the trier of fact. And a trained forensic uh, psychiatrist uh, is uh, very familiar with that and uh, well-educated. It is always important to be truthful. In life, it's always easier because one can easily remember the truth, uh, but remembering later on, uh, trials can be long, legal cases can be years. Uh, remembering what one constructed becomes very hard and one can actually uh, put themselves in, into a lot of trouble. The scope of expert work, uh, in ex we can be involved in administrative processes, insurance, disability, employer schools may have an issue, civil malpractice, psychiatric or psychic damages, and of course, child custody uh, and in criminal uh, competency to stand trial is the most often uh, proceeding where forensic mental health professionals are involved. But likewise, we might participate in violence risk assessment in insanity, often talked about, but rarely filed, and mitigation, as well as conditional release, uh, and also drug diversion courts, mental health diversion courts, where a forensic uh, mental health professional might stipulate uh, what the treatment requirement or treatment goals should be. Competency to stand trial most often raised, 
and uh, the most common evaluation in the United States in the uh, criminal arena. What do all these people on the pictures have in common? They have in common that they all raised the insanity uh, defense. Not all prevailed. And uh, before we close, I wanted to review with you uh, just Daniel McNaughton, who always comes up when it's about forensic psychiatry and the insanity uh, defense. It goes back to 1843 in England. And what we need to always remember is McNaughton was never tried under the McNaughton test. It was the first appellate court decision regarding insanity that's depicted here. The party accused was laboring under such a defect of reason from disease of the mind as not to know the nature and quality of the act, whether the accused knew the difference between right and wrong in respect to the very act with which he is charged. This is the foundation of most insanity tests uh, throughout the United States. It is a cognitive test and it has the arm of the nature and quality going back to the English test, the wild beast and the wrongfulness going back to making decisions over children in English times and it has to be specific to the act. Um, when it comes to any crimes and uh, mental illness, it's important for the evaluator, important for all parties involved uh, to be mindful that there can be mental illness uh, in various, at various levels and settings. Only crime due to psychosis, due to mental illness, is worthy a consideration for uh, an excuse under an insanity. But there can be crime due to desires, personality disorder, uh, coincidental mental illness unrelated to the uh, forbidden act. Uh, there can be, of course, mental illness later on once somebody is thrown into uh, jail or prison and it's very depressing and there can be malingered mental illness uh, as part of an insanity plea. I wanted to finish up uh, with a story uh, to make a teaching point. This is something that is often done not correctly by the naive forensic examiner. And I'd like to tell you the hypothetical story of two equally psychotic patients who are hospitalized here at OU and they're stolen, both of them. Patient A has schizophrenia and hears voices and stolen a car and patient B stolen a car also has schizophrenia. And of course, it was the car of Dr. Sandbar uh, who loves riding in his Porsche, life is good. And as patient A leaves the parking lot here uh, adjacent to this building, uh, an OU police officer stops patient A and says, hello, what are you doing in the car? And patient A say, what do you mean what I'm doing in the car? Take your hands off my car. I own all silver colored Porsches in the world. Don't you know that? All right, the officer thinks, I'm gonna take a break, I'm gonna take it easy. Well, a couple hours later, patient B comes in the same car as Dr. Sandbar's car. And the officer said, I can't believe it. No, you're doing the same. I mean, what, what's going on here? This isn't your car. And patient B says, yeah, I do have schizophrenia. I'm here, I hear voices whoops, you caught me hardwiring another beautiful car. So the difference is, I know that you know that in the legal field, only patient A uh, would be worthy to be un entertained under an insanity defense because the very act is directly related to what some judges used to call in the past the product of mental illness, the symptoms 
of, in this case, delusions of owning all silver colored Porsches in the world, but for the delusion, patient A would not have stolen uh, the uh, car and committed the forbidden act. That brings me to the end of my presentation. And thank you so very much for the privilege uh, of uh, being in front of you and presenting.